Welcome to the EKG Guy. I'm glad you could join us if this is your first time. Welcome back. So what we want to do here and what we've been doing is going through our ECG coding reference guide, you know, step by step, making sure that you understand why we put what we put there. Okay. And so let's go and see how we get access. So those of you that don't have access, um, there's a few ways you can do it. Okay. You can go to www.ekg.md. But you may notice that we're making lots of changes, adding new resources to the website. Uh, so while that would be a way to find it, ideally I would say to put this in, okay? This is a uh, sure way that you won't uh, be able to miss it. So put that into that URL into your search bar, get there, uh, put your email address in, press submit, okay? Go to your email, check it, and then confirm that's your email and you will get access, okay? You only have to do that the first time. So if you already have access, go to that site, put your email in and press submit and you should be there. Okay, you'll come to the ECG coding reference guide and there you can see these areas that you can click down on and expand. We have 10 different parts. Uh, here we're gonna be looking at part one and we'll look at a normal borderline normal ECG or normal variant, okay, and what that entails. So again, what you'll have to do is go to the site, put your email address in, click this first one and you'll get to where we start. So here we have our borderline normal ECG or normal variant, we call it, okay? Again, the purpose of these videos is not to explain every aspect of the ECG. This is supposed to be a quick reference guide. If you want instructions on every rhythm and everything, we'll get to those rhythms, okay? But the goal here is to ensure that you understand what these codes we use are, okay? Because this is how, when we get an EKG in the clinical uh, place, you know, it's initially read by the computer, then we have our text, and then the physicians overread it. And these are the codes we're using, okay? And when you're a fellow and you have to take your board exams, this is what you have to code. So this is uh, what we're doing. So the borderline normal ECG, let's take a look here, okay? Here's an example. And you'll find this example if you go to the site. So we left examples there. And you'll notice that there's a few different things that are considered borderline normal or a normal variant, okay? The first one is called early repolarization. Now this is a normal finding that we can see in healthy individuals, okay? And it, it's expected that almost half of people have some sort of uh, ST elevation that we'll notice. So it's some ST T segment elevation, okay? And you often see can, a distinct notch uh, that can be found there, okay? And that's something that we look for with pericarditis versus early repolarization, okay, as in this case. Uh, now, I, I want you to note that while early repolarizations tends to be considered normal, there's been some studies that say that these patients are actually at risk for uh, arrhythmogenesis or bad arrhythmias, in other words, okay? So keep that in uh, place. So it's not really benign early repolarization anymore. So, um, so what we can see is this elevation, and we tend to see it here in these precordial leads. So V2, V3, V4, and V5, okay? Often V2 and V3 are the most common ones. And notice that if you look at our ST segment, there is some elevation there, okay? Maybe a little bit here. You can see some of that notching that we talk about, okay? That fish hook pattern that can be seen with benign early repolarization. And what you have is, again, uh, we have that distinct notch in, in the downstroke of the R wave, okay, that we're talking about there that we can see. And then you have this elevated concave upward takeoff. So what do we mean by that? Okay, so if you look here, so this is a elevation of the ST segment and notice that it's concave up, okay? That's what we mean by that, all right? So that tends to be more of a benign finding. Now, one way someone initially taught me is if you take that and then follow that and then put two eyes, it's a smiley face. So this tends to be a more benign finding. So again, if you use this one, that's one way, okay, to keep in mind. Um, so there's different morphologies to the ST segment, and this just happens to be, if you see that, it tends to be more of a benign finding, okay? Not always the case. All right, so that's what we can see with a borderline normal ECG. So everything else is normal here, but then you see that, and that's something to note, okay? So usually in those uh, anterolateral precordial leads, the anterior ones, we see that in. All right, so 
Notice that everything else is normal. This is normal sinus rhythm. You have normal axis here. You have normal R wave progression and so forth. So everything else is normal. The rate is normal here. It's just that finding. Now, another few things I want to discuss are some of these others that we can find that I'm not sure are actually present in this example, but there's something called juvenile T waves, which we discussed in our pediatric course, okay, which I think we have not launched yet, but that should be coming out soon. Now, what you see in this are negative T waves in V1 through V3. So we don't have them here. You have these negative T waves here, but from V1, V2, you can see these persisting. So what happens is like early on, you're born um, in their, I think this way, and then you know they revert at some age, and then I think at seven, they come back to the other way. Sometimes patients uh, or children don't have them where they revert back to normal, and we call those persistent juvenile T waves. Um, so oftentimes it's a not really common finding to be honest, but, uh, there's something that we consider that a normal T wave. Okay. So not all negative T waves are considered ischemic. Okay. You'll see people saying, oh, there's flip T waves. Well, that's not always the case. Now, if they're dynamic, meaning they're changing over time, the patient's symptomatic, obviously you should take that to account and that may be, uh, early signs of ischemia. Okay. But simply, you know, T waves that are flipped or inverted, is not always a sign of ongoing ischemia. Okay. So, uh, these are negative T waves again in V1 to V3, typically not deep or symmetrical. Okay, remember, symmetric T waves are more pathologic compared to asymmetric. So notice that these T waves have the slow upstroke and downstroke. The, those are normal T waves. Okay. Now, another normal finding or, uh, you know, type of these borderline ECGs that we can see are S waves in leads V1 or lead 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And this is seen in about 20% of all healthy adults. It's a benign finding. And what you can see are the, here's the S waves, okay, barely present here, small ones maybe, and not present in lead three, okay, so not present there, but if you see those, those are, tend to be normal findings, okay, in about 20% of adults. Another thing you can see are incomplete right bundle branch block, okay, so you have that right bundle branch block morphology, that pattern, the RSR prime pattern. Uh, with a narrow QRS complex. Remember, incomplete versus complete is based on the QRS interval. Okay, so if you, here's our P wave, our QRS complex, and T wave. When we talk about incomplete versus uh, complete, we're simply looking at the interval here. What is that duration? Okay, often the machine will give it to you. Normal, less than 120 milliseconds. Okay, so if it's less than 120, we consider that incomplete. Okay, and then if it's beyond that, complete or 120 more. Okay. So an incomplete and honestly, a right bundle branch block pattern alone doesn't get us too excited. Okay. It doesn't make, you know, too much alarm. Sometimes patients can have this. All right. So what you see in V1, okay. And sometimes V2 are these RSR prime. So what you would have is if we just take this here, okay. And we draw that pattern, you may have uh, something like this. Okay an R, so this is an R, S, and R prime, and the duration from beginning or end is less than 120 milliseconds, okay? That initial R wave amplitude, which is this one here, is less than seven millimeters or small boxes, okay? That initial R wave. And the R prime, okay, is usually less than the R or the S wave amplitude, okay? So that's a, one other thing to keep in mind. But really, you see that RSR prime, it's less than 120 milliseconds, okay? Um, usually a normal variant and nothing to be too alarmed about, all right? So again, just to recap what we saw here, we didn't see some of those findings on this EKG, but on this EKG, we did see that um, early repolarization pattern in those precordial leads, V2, uh, V3 and V4, and almost into V5 as well, okay? Again, not really benign because, you know, there's now some that are saying that these patients may be at risk for uh, more uh, life-threatening arrhythmia, so something to keep aware of. The juvenile T waves, where you have persistent uh, T waves that are negative or inverted in V1 through V3, they're not deep or symmetrical, so not really abnormal. Uh, the S waves in leads one, two, and three are seen in about 20% of adults, not in this case here in this ECG, and then in incomplete right bundle branch block pattern. Okay, again, often 
uh, normal variant, nothing too concerning in most cases. All right, so that narrow QRS complex that we mentioned and that RSR prime pattern. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. This is a borderline normal ECG or normal variant. Okay, everything else is normal in this case other than what we said to the early repolarization pattern. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available. So again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md. Okay, so this is our website. And what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute. And this is the course here, over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100 more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, okay? And then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide. Uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay, and these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there, okay. We'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there very small pocket guide available i had help with uh, my colleague dr peter noseworthy who's the head of the ekg lab here at mayo clinic and editing it so this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful so go to the ekg course you'll see examples of lectures okay why we developed this okay a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay? You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay? And you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.